This is Michael Aquino. In addition to being a fashion icon, Aquino founded the Temple of Set. Yes, Set, the Egyptian deity who hacked Osiris to pieces. What would inspire Aquino to worship a figure like this? You've probably heard of Anton LaVey and the Church of Satan. See, Aquino was a card-carrying member of LaVey's religion, but still felt a Satan-sized hole in his heart. The Church of Satan, despite their name, doesn't really worship Satan. They revere the fallen angel as a symbol of independence, self-determination, and freedom. Your average Levian Satanist would probably say they're an atheist. Aquino wasn't an atheist. He was a true believer. He performed a ritual to conjure the Dark One, and Set showed up. During their little chit-chat, Set said that he was the one Aquino was really seeking. Aquino, a theistic Satanist, broke from LeVay to found his own church, dedicated to the worship of Set slash Satan. As you'd probably guess, Aquino was a down-to-earth, well-adjusted guy. Here's a clip of him doing a little show-and-tell, and talking about his totally normal hobbies. On this altar is uh, one of a number of daggers, which we may use in our rituals. This one happened to belong to the commanding general of the most elite unit of Germany's infamous SS, which was concerned with black magic and occultism research in general. Anything that it could find that had to do with the uh, origins of the human race, destiny of humanity. The perverted view of the occult held by Heinrich Himmler was of an evil magic that could help create a new master race. Wevelsberg Castle is where he performed his ceremonies. I have been to the Wevelsberg, which still preserves Heinrich Himmler's ritual chambers to this day, and have conducted a black magical ritual in the so-called Hall of the Dead beneath the Wevelsberg. This particular dagger is inscribed to our comrade in the Leibstandarte Theodor Wisch, Brigadefuhrer, a major general in the Waffen SS. And on its blade, it bears the inscription, Mine era heist Troy, or my honor shall be known by my faithfulness. What, you might be wondering, did a guy like Aquino do for a living? Did he work at a comic book shop? Was he an organizer for his local Renaissance fair? As a matter of fact, Michael Aquino was an officer in the United States Army. He was a lieutenant colonel who worked in military intelligence and led work in psychological operations. This is the Temple of Set. The temple is the only international satanic religious institution fully recognized by the United States government. Surely this is something the U.S. Armed Forces would consider embarrassing. Whatever projects Aquino was involved with must be highly classified, if for no other reason than his eccentric personal life. But this isn't the case at all. In fact, Aquino's essay, From PSYOP to Mind War, The Psychology of Victory, is freely available online. Feel free to read it. I've included a link in the description. Let's take a look at this little gem. While the article dates from 1980, the version on archive.org begins with an introduction by Aquino written in 2003. In it, Aquino defends his work, saying that the article and he himself have been grossly mischaracterized. He has decided to release the full article to the public to dispel any rumors of a nefarious occult plot to use black magic mind control as a weapon at home or abroad. The main thrust of Aquino's article is that psyops, as they're traditionally defined, have always taken a back seat to traditional tactical operations. Their success and implementation have been limited, in part because they've always been treated with skepticism by the military establishment. Aquino proposes that a new form of psychological warfare, which he calls mind war, should replace the old psyops. So let us begin with a simple name change, he writes. We shall rid ourselves of the self-conscious, almost embarrassed concept of psychological operations. In its place, we shall create mind war. The term is harsh and fear-inspiring, and so it should be. It is a term of attack and victory, not one of the rationalization and coaxing and conciliation. The enemy may be offended by it. That is quite all right, as long as he is defeated by it. A definition is offered. Mind war is the deliberate, aggressive convincing of all participants in a war that we will win that war. 
The bulk of the article is more than reasonable. In fact, it reads like a thoughtful solution to the bloody foreign interventions that have cost so many lives and so much money. Aquino is explicit, for example, in his criticism of the military-industrial complex, writing, The advantage of mind war is that it conducts wars in non-lethal, non-injurious, and non-destructive ways. Essentially, you overwhelm your enemy with argument. You seize control of all the means by which his government and populace process information to make up their minds, and you adjust it so that those minds are made up as you desire. Everyone is happy, no one gets hurt or killed, and nothing is destroyed. Ordinary warfare, on the other hand, is characterized by its lack of reason. The antagonists just maim or kill each other's people, and steal or destroy each other's land until one side is hurt so badly that it gives up, or both sides are hurt so badly that they agree to stop short of victory. After such a war, there's lasting misery, hate, and suffering. The only loser in mind war are the war profiteers, companies and corporations which grow fat on orders for helicopters, tanks, guns, munitions, etc. Consequently, what President Dwight Eisenhower referred to as the military-industrial complex can be counted upon to resist implementation of mind war as the governing strategic conflict doctrine. Unlike traditional psyops, mind war begins far before troops reach the battlefield. In fact, strategic mind war must begin the moment war is considered to be inevitable. Every available medium must be used to draw the enemy's attention, and hostile nations must be struck before its potential soldiers put on their uniforms. It's not the military barracks that the specialists in mind war target, rather their homes and communities. Was the United States, Aquino asks, defeated in the jungles of Vietnam, or was it defeated in the streets of American cities? Another perk of mind war is that, unlike traditional propaganda, it relies on truth and moral superiority. The propagandist is most effective when telling half-truths, dissembling inconvenient facts to push a narrative. The mind warrior, on the other hand, must be deeply committed to his cause. His conviction that he's in the right is indispensable to his task. It is this conviction, his honesty, that will convince the undemocratic forces in other nations that the American way of life is superior. A rapport will be created between the mind warrior and his target, and the enemy will see that those he's told to fight are working for a nobler cause than the totalitarian regime he serves. Maybe Aquino isn't such a creep after all. Maybe he's just a LARPer with his heart in the right place. Given his totally normal hobbies, you'd imagine that, during his time in the military, his conduct was above suspicion. Here, charges surface connecting ritual child abuse at the Presidio Daycare Center to the Devil Cult. It was here, parents and others allege, that as many as 60 young children were ritualistically abused by soldiers of Satan. The former chief juvenile investigator at the Presidio, Ed Abinovsky, is here. He's now a deputy sheriff in Santa Clara County. Colonel Laquino, we note, sir, for the record, that you were originally implicated in the dreadful charges of child abuse. We note also that no charges were ever brought against you, and presumably you have been cleared. Would you like to comment on why those charges were brought against you? Well, the entire time that uh, the so-called child station scandal was occurring at the Presidio, the time period when um, uh, these terrible events were supposedly taking place, I was assigned to the National Defense University in Washington, D.C., and my wife was out there living with me. But is it not a fact that a three-and-a-half-year-old girl identified you as the alleged perpetrator of No, as uh, a matter of fact, it is not the case. An accusation was made by her stepfather, who was an army chaplain, speaking on behalf of this child. In her original interview with the FBI, she denied ever being molested. Well, I've seen the... I, I, you are innocent until proven guilty. You were never charged in this case. I don't want to belabor the point. I have seen, however, the affidavits for the search warrant of your home, and they indicate the child is speaking to the authorities, not her father. This was after she had been subjected to uh, therapy. Well, that's pretty bad. That's so bad that Subway Jared would be grossed out. At least it doesn't get any worse, right? Mr. Quino and his wife, um, who, you are a lieutenant colonel in the United States Army. Correct. Now, and how does the Army feel about you being head of the Temple of Set? The Army has known about my religion for um, uh, the entire 
span of my Army career, which mm -hmm. began in 1968. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there was a reasonable amount of curiosity, as there has been all the way along, mm -hmm. with um, what exactly is this strange and unusual thing. And I've uh, talked about it in much the same way that I've talked here today on your show about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, other than that, the Ar Army has paid uh, very little attention to it, the same as it would to anybody who is, say, a, a follower of Hinduism or of um, Buddhism or any other slightly unusual religion today. So you just go about your Army duties and it's fine and... and, mm -hmm. and okay? Yeah. Um, I was a follower of the Satanist Church uh, the, in Chicago here. Um, I'm, Wal I'm Walpurgis Knox. Uh, I was uh, the head acolyte for that specific ceremony, and at the end of it, it w we wound up murdering someone. And a person? Yes, ma'am. Um, it wasn't anybody that I knew, and I reported it. But once I had reported it and decided that to quit the Satanist Church. I started receiving threatening phone calls. People would come up to my door who I didn't know, and all they'd do is say, go back to the church, and then they'd walk away. They'd never give me their name or address or anything. I received threatening mail. My mail was opened. My little sister was harassed coming to and from mm -hmm. school several times. So what happened in the, in the, in the ritual where someone was, was murdered? And how were they murdered? Uh, they were stabbed seven times with with knives because in, the, in Chicago yes. to be fair Aquino was never charged with or convicted of a crime there's no fire but that's a whole lot of smoke given all these nasty accusations not to mention his demeanor in interviews let's take another look at Aquino's paper maybe he's dressing up some very ugly goals in fancy language Since mind war, unlike traditional propaganda, is anchored in truth, we shouldn't have any qualms about using it on American citizens. We read, Mind war must target all participants if it is to be effective. It must not only weaken the enemy, it must strengthen the United States. It strengthens the United States by denying enemy propaganda access to our people and by explaining and emphasizing to our people the rationale for our national interest in a specific war. Under existing United States law, PSYOP units may not target American citizens. That prohibition is based upon the presumption that propaganda is necessarily a lie, or at least a misleading half-truth, and that the government has no right to lie to the people. The propaganda ministry of Goebbels must not be part of the American way of life. While he performed occult rituals with Himmler's knife and in the SS general's castle, it's nice to know, at least, that Aquino was selective in the Nazis he admired. Unlike brainwashing or traditional propaganda, the goal of Mind War is to get the mind to believe its own decisions and to feel that it made those decisions without coercion. To be effective, whatever measures are used must not be detectable by ordinary means. Of course, the use of media is essential to such a project, but this is merely the sociological dimension, in Aquino's words, of the operation. There are, he writes, some purely natural conditions under which minds may become more or less receptive to ideas, and mind war should take full advantage of such phenomena as atmospheric electromagnetic activity, air ionization, and extremely low frequency waves. You might think you didn't hear that right, but I bet you did. And in case you don't have your tinfoil hat on yet, Aquino describes each of these purely natural conditions in enough detail to turn the squarest of normies into a conspiracy theorist. Aquino notes that the human body communicates internally by electromagnetic and electrochemical impulses. Human sensitivity to electromagnetic fields can be shown, he writes, in the body's reaction to X-rays, infrared radiation, visible light spectra, and so forth. The Earth's electromagnetic field is regularly altered by such phenomena as sunspot eruptions and gravitational stresses, which distort the Earth's magnetic field. Under varying external EM conditions, he writes, humans are more or less disposed to the consideration of new ideas. Mind war, Aquino says, should be timed accordingly. 
One can't help but wonder if, in the three decades since the publication of Aquino's paper, tools have been developed to create conditions in the EM field that make a targeted population more susceptible to suggestion. Another footnote reads, an abundance of negative condensation nuclei, air ions, when ingested enhances alertness and exhilaration, while an excess of positive ions enhances drowsiness and depression. Calculation of the ionic balance of a target audience's atmospheric environment will be correspondingly useful. Aquino is careful to qualify that this is a naturally occurring condition caused by such varying agents as sonar ultraviolet light, lightning, and rapidly moving water. So it doesn't, he says, need to be artificially created. It is chilling, though, that he ends his treatment of this subject by stating that detonation of nuclear weapons will alter atmospheric ionization levels. Maybe this paper is only advocating the use of naturally occurring conditions to encourage a state in which targets are more open to democratic ideas. If you believe that, I've got a bridge to sell you. If you're suspicious, Aquino's footnote about ELF waves won't do much to ease your mind. He writes, ELF waves up to 100 hertz are once more naturally occurring, but they can also be produced artificially, such as for the Navy's Project Sanguine for submarine communication. ELF waves are not normally noticed by the unaided senses, yet their resonant effect upon the human body has been connected to both physiological disorders and emotional distortion. Infrasound vibration, up to 20 Hz, can subliminally influence brain activity to align itself to delta, theta, alpha, or beta wave patterns, inclining an audience toward everything from alertness to passivity. Infrasound could be used tactically as ELF waves endure for great distances, and it could be used in conjunction with media broadcasts as well. It's frequently claimed that America is a champion of Judeo-Christian values and civil liberties. If our military is conducting mind war on its own citizens, employing techniques so subtle, so diabolical as to make the mind feel that it made those decisions without coercion, it's hard to believe that our ideals are anything but empty rhetoric. But the wise man doesn't put his faith in princes or nations or force. Perhaps St. Paul said it best in his letter to the Ephesians when he wrote, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. St. Michael the Archangel, defend us in battle.